Well, I grew up on Lake West Point in Grange, so naturally having it out my back door, the tendency as a as a boy with other boys in the neighborhood running around was to spend some time on the on the bank, crappy fishing, um, you know, hoping for bass. We had canoes. Um, lived in a nice little cove, so we were constantly out there paddling and, and fishing. And actually had a, a guide at the time on West Point that lived a couple houses up from us that had a bunch of big bass mounted on his wall that was enough inspiration to want to stay on the lake and and go after it. So that was uh, kind of the the very beginnings. How big a lake was it? West Point's a, a big lake, probably the second or third biggest in Georgia. But, you know, we had a nice little, uh, at the time when we were really young, you know, we had our boundaries set by parents. But we definitely, uh, back in the early 80s, were kind of free to roam and, and do as we pleased as long as we were home by dinner you know and and, uh so we roamed as far as we could you know and and still be able to get home mainly you know zebco 33s and graduated to a couple of spinning rods and before we started tying knots with our bait casters you know trying to learn that that deal also had had a little time in the mountains with my grandmother which i think probably talk about later but it she was more of a trout trout influence um and my granddad had a had a house in panama city and so that kind of gave me my, you know, opened my eyes on our summer vacations to the saltwater thing. He'd drag us out in the boat and let us throw up and, and catch snappers and whatnot while we all turned green. So welcome in, everybody. This is David Perry at Southeastern Fly. We're talking with Cleve Evans of Forgotten Coast on the Fly. Cleve can be found at ForgottenCoastOnTheFly.com. Before we get too far into this... Tell me where is the where is the Forgotten Coast? Uh, the Forgotten Coast it's a, it's on the Florida Panhandle. It's kind of a area starting just east of Panama City, kind of extending to the east to roughly Alligator Point, kind of south of of Tallahassee. The Alligator Point, I think, is kind of the the, the line. You know, and that includes St. George Island, Apalachicola, St. Joe, Cape San Blas, Mexico Beach. Beautiful, pretty laid back. Fairly old school Florida, comparatively speaking, to some some other parts of Florida. So what what kind of uh, so you're you're a fishing guide, obviously. Uh-huh. Uh, what kind of what kind of fish are you going after? Um, we folk, you know, redfish here on the on the Panhandle is kind of our bread and butter. They're here year round. We get them off the beaches. We get them in the bays. We get them up in the back country on the on the shallow flats from slot size fish, which are legal keeper size, 18 to 27 inches to big bulls to 30 plus pounds. And then you have everything else uh, that, you know, and trout are here year round um, and they're a target. Not as much on fly for a lot of people because they're tough to, to sight fish to with a fly rod. But then we have a lot of seasonal migratory you know, species kind of starting in the spring with Spanish mackerel, cobia, pompano, um, and then you get the jack Revelle that come in late spring, and then you get your tarpon migration that starts late spring and kind of runs through summer. Most of those continue through the fall, and then they kind of start to head south following the bait to warmer water. And then we got our redfish, which is good year-round. So it's a uh, lot, lot of variety. I mean, you got triple tail, you got sheep's head, you got, you know, a lot of different things that you can target depending on the conditions and where you are and, and what you want to do. Um, and most of those are good on the fly. Most, of those, most, most all of those, those are definitely fly um, catchable, you know, and, and there's offshore stuff too, your amberjack and your red snapper and mahi and, and stuff that I don't target really, at least not at this point, just because I only have the uh, the skiff, the inshore kind of skiff. So well, let's talk about the skiff because I've been on it a couple of times uh-huh. now. What, let's talk about that. That's kind of your home on the water. Yeah the office yeah what yeah. what are you what are you pulling these days uh it's a 18 foot um beaver tail vengeance got a little 70 yamaha four stroke on it which kind of gives me my best or shallowest draft a lot of what i do is is you know i need to be able to get really really shallow eight inches or so to get into where the redfish are and it's a a big big enough skiff to be comfortable uh, and stable but also shallow enough draft to 
to pole in in really skinny water. So for the listener out there, I'll tell I'll tell this story. So my grandfather, my uncle, when I was young. 10 to 12 years old. They had a friend that owned a big boat and they went out to the Chandelier Islands on that big boat and they pulled small boats behind them. That's how they that's how they did it. They they basically geared they gear fished mostly. Uh but they came back from that trip. I don't remember how many people but anyway went with them, but they came back from that trip and for a couple of years that's all they talked about was we went to the chandelier islands blah 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 it was great we fished for this and that and sharks and reds and you know all the things that just me being that age i was just like wow i've got to get out there (laughs) so fast forward to a couple of years ago i've got a trip set up with uh with you Uh over in louisiana and i can't remember where did we i can't remember what place we stayed at the southern comfort place whatever the name of that is Oh, y'all stayed at, at uh, Woodland Plantation? Yeah, Woodland. Yeah, 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 yeah. we yeah. stayed there. Yeah. So we roll into Woodland just about dark, and the phone rings, and it's Cleve. And Cleve says, got your boats ready, because we had a smaller group at that time. Got your boats ready. Hey, do you mind traveling by boat about an hour to go to the Chandelier Islands? And, of course, I mean, that was like, I couldn't describe how great that was. <laughs> But so we we get in your boat and it's how far is that ride out it's there? It's forty two miles from the boat ramp, and we made it in about an hour. If hour, I remember, hour and fifteen minutes. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't. A, it yeah. was a, we, were, we were running about thirty three, thirty four. Yeah, like that. and it was a nice smooth day on the water. It wasn't mm-hmm. like yesterday. No, coming back nice. across the bay yesterday, it was nice and smooth that day. Going out, we buzzed right across there. Super comfortable. You pick your days in the skiffs, though. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're not going to run sure. through there with you know no. three or four foot seas. But. <laughs> But it was a, it's a big deal to run out that far in a skiff, and we got out there, and we were on reds just almost right away. Yeah, I mean, you're out of sight of land for 20, 25 minutes when yeah. you're scooting across there, which when you're in an 18-foot skiff, you know, can be a little under. When we do it, we always do it with a buddy or two, you know, two or three boats, um, just to be safe. You know? <laughs> just to be safe. It was an adventure, and that's what yeah. these podcasts are, are yeah. kind of about. It so was, It was a lot of fun. So you start to... Uh, so that was my that was my skiff. Yeah, I talk about that when I do presentations and stuff uh-huh. too. If people want to talk about saltwater, I say, okay, get this. You know, we uh-huh. <laughs> we, we went out to the chandelier, and uh, inevitably somebody will say, "So did you say that you took a big boat and pulled the boat?" Mm-hmm. So I was like, "No, dude, we go. We we took we off and took we off. went." Yeah, he's like in a in a skiff. Yeah, Poland skiff, skiff. that'll float in eight inches of water. Yeah, yeah. one of those. So <laughs> so you you you're living on the lake and. You're fishing with gear and everything's good, and then all of a sudden, you talked about your grandmother. She, she had a place somewhere she in North Georgia. She has a yeah, a cabin, a family cabin that she'd had since long before I I was here in a little town called Suches, in a little recreational area called Lake Winfield Scott. Pretty unique little deal. It's it's a there's a couple of little cabin, a little road, little dirt roads that wind back into the mountains and and. There's about 25 cabins up there. They're on federal leases, so they lease the the land from the federal government. They they build their cabins, and at any time they could be revoked for whatever reason. So they're taking that chance. But luckily, they're on their second, or our family now is on the second 50 year lease. So I think we're about 15 years into it. So we got you know 35 years to go until we have to renew, which is probably the rest of my time. So I'll get to enjoy it hopefully for. <laughs> For forever and she was she was definitely a um a, a mountain lady she knew everybody she canned everything she could she had a garden a community garden they canned everything i mean stuff you'd never think could be canned they had big gatherings and whether it be church or or just getting together with all the the other cabin owners and we were lucky to have that. I would go to a summer camp up in North Georgia from basically when I was five till I was about 16 and go for two weeks and at the beginning of June. And after that, I was me and, and about eight cousins were left with my grandmother um, for about a month, which, you know, was if, when I was younger, I was like, oh, all my friends are in LaGrange. I don't, but then I started realizing, wait a minute, I've, I, I, that was some of the best best times of my life. She she was obsessed with with trout. Granted, they were they were all stock trout, but they were trout, you know. And, and they provided her with not only entertainment and fun and hours of sitting on Cooper's Creek and and on Lake Winfield Scott, 
you know, relaxing and enjoying and, and contemplated. But she also was able to feed all the cabin owners and the community at least once a year with this huge fish fry that that they did and she was responsible whether i don't know if they made her responsible or if she made herself responsible but she basically supplied the trout and that's where the eight grandkids came into play (laughs) and that's where i began to do the mountain stream and the trout thing and you know back in the early 80s fly fishing wasn't at its peak by any means especially not in the southeast you know there's definitely people doing it we would see them doing it we didn't really understand why they were doing it you know we were mm-hmm. like ah, that doesn't look productive i've got salmon eggs and corn and, and you know that's, filling up our basket here and, and at know? that age especially that age yeah you know numbers are numbers are it i caught 20 oh, i caught 10 catch, i caught yeah. five you got eight one. cousins you're yeah. you're you got to catch the most so um, and grandma's got an army of kids out there yeah which is fantastic she's probably killing two birds with uh, one we're stone. covering a half a mile <laughs> of creek um, so she's 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 catching fish for the community and you're really kind of out of her hair yeah and we're <laughs> learning you know and we're getting to roam and we're getting to build dams in the creek and do you know just do do what kids do but at the same time helping her fill up her freezer so that she can make the whole community happy which then kind of reciprocates around to we're we're a bunch of little heroes you know we're (laughs) we're out there catching the messes of trout you know and she she would she knew all the the game wardens all the fisheries guys she was cooking them pies she was doing whatever to brown nose them to to get the information she needed about exactly when the stocking truck was gonna and they used to pull right into the creeks and I'm sure you've, you know, you know, they, they just had these areas where they just made a road across the creek. They'd pull the truck right into the middle of the creek and pull the plug, and the yeah. trout would just pour out, out into the creek. Some of them would go up, and some of them would, they'd all get in the pools right below. And they did the same thing at the lake, at, the, at Lake Winfield Scott up there. They'd pull over on the bridge, pull the plug, and all the trout would just... But she had all the intel. I mean, she, you know, this is way before Internet or, or any way to really you know stay on top of things other than knowledge and knowing the right people and whatnot so we'd be waiting on that plug to pull on that truck with our salmon eggs and our corn and we'd go to catching trout and we'd catch them up we'd roll back to the she had a el camino um (laughs) yeah an old el camino two-tone el camino what color was it? It was like green and like two tones of green, like this kind of lighter green and then this darker kind of brown green, like was the it, middle panel. The middle panel, yeah. yeah. That's what I was and say. uh <laughs> thing had like a four fifty four in it. I don't or some kind of huge engine in it. You know, it's it's all so it had the two seats in the front, which was like a big bench seat across. You put about three or four of us. Then it had the seats behind the seats. You could fit two or three back there. And then you had the seats in the back that faced the other way. And so that's what we'd go. And it's a good little ride from the cabin. It's probably, seemed like a long ways. It's probably five miles. But it's through four service roads, you know, and it's winding dirt roads. And, and she'd just go tearing out across there. I'm um, getting this picture in my mind. I'm sure that it's dead on, too, of an older lady driving a bunch of rugrats around. And, and she, she was, you Still know, got the and she was, she was about probably five foot four, fairly rotund. I mean, she was, but she was a mess. I mean, <laughs> she didn't hesitate to get in the creek, cross the creek, get, she knew where the best stumps, you know, the best bends with the undercut trees were. She knew where the trout held up. So you know? she knew the habitat of the oh, fish. She knew it. She knew, really? the, she knew about, so you had the, you had the top, the put in at the top the, the, or the, uh, the furthest put in upstream and then there was a bridge south of there a couple of miles and then there was another bridge south of there well she knew where those fish would would hang in between the bridge in between the put ins and not and i'm talking about when everybody else has figured out or thought that all the trout had been caught you yeah because that's kind of how it went they'd put two thousand in and within three week two weekends or whatever they'd pretty much get caught she would she would amaze other other people locals and other cabin owners with the fact that she was still bringing trout back to the freezer and all all for the you know ultimately for the fish fry that they had as as lake winfield scott and the community had in august every year was was her goal was to make sure she had hundreds and hundreds of trout to fry so inadvertently i learned my way around the mountains and we didn't just fish coopers we fished nautily sometimes we'd go to the Dakota. 
sometimes we'd go to rock creek you know we went we got around a little bit but but cooper's was the kind of the the main it was the closest and it's not a big creek you know it's 20 feet wide it's a, it's a small little stream but so when was the last time you were there man i don't get up there since i've you know moved to florida i don't get up there as much as i should i think i was up there labor day last year i always tell myself i'm going to get up there at least once every two months or something even if it's just for a week i mean it's a six and a half hour drive well worth it though you know to get in the mountains and and get out and and because such as is it's a little jewel i mean it's a it's the highest valley in georgia it to be an hour and a half or so from atlanta it's like it doesn't exist you know and and for whatever reason it stayed that way and and i hope it always does but it's a neat place and it's it's always 15 degrees cooler there in the summer than it is in you know Gainesville or Atlanta south of there and yeah I I, I try to, I, I probably only get up there twice a year I'm sitting yeah. here watching Cleve walk down memory lane mm-hmm. this is what I'm doing right yeah. now uh, it's, look it's out fun to my to left talk about it look out to my left in the 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 Gulf of Mexico is there I look at straight across and he's in Georgia <laughs> in <the> somewhere mountains. <laughs> yeah you are. that's crazy and I was a mountain man for a long time I mean <laughs> I, I lived in you know outside of Asheville and Black Mountain I, li- I worked and lived at the Nanahale Outdoor Center for three years I, I was I was almost convinced that mountains were going to be my my deal and then I got the taste of you know not only fly fishing in the mountains and for trout but then the saltwater thing and that's what yeah grabbed me and wouldn't let that's go what threw you know, your life out of balance yeah, like the rest yeah. of us yeah uh-huh. so what'd your grandmother call you when you were in trouble um chibi 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 i don't know if that's i don't know why but that's what her name for me when i was in trouble and we were in trouble a lot because there was so we all got called a lot of things now chibi might be the the name she called me she was definitely not gonna not use other <laughs> <laughs> words to communicate to us i mean she was to let you know she was she was the real deal yeah she chased us around that cabin with wooden spoons and switches and fly swatters and whatever else you yeah. know but she was trying to manage a group of heathens like managing <laughs> a dang football team yeah. or something right and, and here all our parents are you know? <laughs> every every all my mom's uh, brothers and sisters all had two two kids and and so we were all within about six or eight years of each other you know so there was as 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 time went on i got a little older there was just more and more the younger ones were coming in and, and they literally just dropped us off and it was it was her deal she managed us she, her cabin slept 21 people only because the upstairs was bunk rooms and and we just raised cane in that place i mean it was great we had four wheelers bikes we could we'd get in trouble by the forest service for tearing up something or another you know we were kids and we didn't know any better and then she'd get in trouble, and they'd threaten to take her lease away, and so then we'd really get in trouble. And it was uh, There's varying degrees at that age of getting in trouble. Isn't yeah, there? yeah. <laughs> I mean, we weren't doing anything. We weren't hurting anybody, but we were. You know, we might think that it was okay to ride the four wheeler on the Appalachian Trail, you know, which is not. <laughs> you know, it isn't. No, no, that's. Let's not, see if we can take it to the top of Blood Mountain. Right. Uh, we're seven. We shouldn't. <laughs> Surely they won't get too mad at us. All right, so let's pay some bills here, Cleve. Uh, at Southeastern Fly, guided drift boat fishing. We're in middle Tennessee. It's tailwater season for us. Uh, we're fishing the Caney Fork, the Elk, and the Obey Rivers. We've been guiding and calling middle Tennessee tailwaters home for almost two decades. At Southeastern Fly, we strive to make every guest a better angler. For more information, go to www.southeasternfly.com. If you want to text or call, the number is 615-796-5143. That's Southeastern Fly. Got your grandmother. She's got you kind of heading in the fishing direction. Let's talk about fly fishing because that's what, imagine that, Southeastern yeah. Fly, yeah, the name. There we go says something uh this is the angler's influence so so let's talk about your second so grandmother's your first influence let's talk Uh, about your second influence there well once i um kind of got the idea to fly fish i'd been fishing for a long time i was i was in my mid-20s when i before i ever really picked up a fly rod and the lead into that was i had a guy that i owned a, a restaurant the guy i had a kid that worked for me that went to alaska every summer super nice worried about his job when he went i said no that's no big deal i understand he knew i fished all the time he he saw pictures and and then he asked if i fly fished i said no he said well i want to I'll, I'll do a deal with you i'm going up to alaska for the summer i'll bring back a, a at the end of the season they do awesome deals on stuff at the shop i'll bring you back a setup you can take it 
play with it. I'll show you a few things. If he you, was he was really secured his job, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> really I couldn't stop him. You yeah. know, I mean, I, I said, and and he had he had it figured out because we were leading in the football season every year, and it was in Auburn, Alabama. So I needed all the help I could get at that point. So he knew he could walk right back in there. <laughs> right, right. But and and I couldn't stop him from doing something he'd been doing for four years or whatever, you know, somewhere he loved. But he said, you know, I'll I'll uh, I'll let you have it, you know, play with it if you want to keep it. You can pay me for it. If not, I'll take it. And uh, he brought me back a little uh, six weight Saint Croix Imperial, which I still have to this day. Um, a little G Loomis. Reel. I don't even know if G. Loomis makes reels anymore. Is that one and of the solid reels on this? Like no, solid it was, on one side? it was, it was, it uh, was cut or whatever. On, it was a little gold reel. Can't remember what the, oh, an East Fork. It was a G. Loomis oh, okay. East Fork. And he brought me back a little trout floating, you know, line. At this point, I, I, he, he showed me the very basics, like the fact that you had to tie a leader onto the end of the fly line and, and kind of explained to me the concept and then he kind of let cut me loose and so i did a little research you know and, and started looking and watching some videos and and uh bought like the fly fishing for dummies book and and just some stuff that you know just to get an idea because growing up in lagrange georgia you're not seeing a lot of fly rods swinging around out on the lake or, <laughs> yeah. or even in north georgia at that time definitely not on the panhandle of florida when we would come down to stay with my granddad you were not seeing people fly fishing for anything they were doing it they were they were hiding and keeping it you know under wraps what um, year was that that was uh well when when he brought me the rod it was like 2003 maybe i think 2003 yeah 2003 so i played with it i got out in the yard started kind of learning to cast at least what I thought I was doing to cast. But I, I was kind of, you know, I was I was intrigued and started to kind of get the hang of it. So I wanted to get good at it. Not far from Auburn at Callaway Gardens, they offered, I looked up and they offered a, a fly fishing school. It was like once a month for almost yeah. every month of the year because they'd bring trout down for the winter and stock, stock their them ponds. In the, yeah, stock them in the ponds. They had amazing yeah. uh, bass fishing and bluegill fishing. Um, we would come down. We came down to Mexico Beach one year, and we stopped at Callaway Gardens, rented a, co- a cabin up there for a night, uh-huh. and we drove through, and I remember Beautiful. seeing, oh, that's that. those are the lakes where they teach the fly fishing yeah. class. And I remember some dude out there. You see him in their float tube? In the float or, tube, yes, yeah, that's yeah, what I was going to yeah, say. And he's yeah. out there just casting away. I'm like, uh-huh. dang, I really, I really need to come down here and do that. And you got yeah. to do that. Yeah, we did it. So I signed up for the class. I think it was like in February and maybe March. It was, it was a little warmer because uh, we did some wet wading over on the flint. I really thought I'd already knew how to cast, you know, at least in my mind. And, and it was... Yeah, and it was it was a 101 class it was basically they went down and started breaking they they explained to you the the parts of the rod the you know it was it was a lot of first half of the first day was all inside and and just so it was it was it was pretty much from the from the you know the start it explained everything why what it is what it's used for how it's used and then we did a little field stuff you know out on the time i think it was a tee box for one of one of the uh holes on the golf course there you know lawn casting and working on some tech you know some the fundamentals basically of casting i mean that's um, the perfect place to learn the tee box it was nice it was yeah. well groomed <laughs> yes yeah. You didn't have to worry about, you know, your pickup or whatever getting snagged by a beef or a, or a, right. a, a root or anything. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he was, you know, it was Ken Edmonds was, was leading the class. Paul Hudson was, was teaching with him. You know, ironically, both from LaGrange where I didn't think fly fishing existed. And, and they're both, you know, Kent obviously well known in the business in the southeast and beyond that. He um, is. Paul's a, a well-respected fly angler and a super nice and awesome dude. And so I kind of, you know, they, they they made me see that that in my mind that fly fishing was was cool. I mean, they were they were doing cool things. I was getting to know them. They were talking about where they'd been and what they'd done and and the fish they were catching on the fly rod. Which at my in my mind, you know, at the time, was thinking this is a trout thing. You know, I mean, this is, that's all I'd really ever seen. Uh, what little I'd seen had been trout, you know, and this was before social media. So this was before Facebook or Instagram or maybe Facebook had just was a, a, a new thing, but definitely fly fishing hadn't taken over Facebook and, and Instagram didn't exist. And, you know, there was maybe, unless you were 
in the industry, you might have seen like an article in one field and stream magazine here and there, but not, you know, you didn't know there was, and there may not have been at the time, 10 publications that were legit that you could get in the mail every month. Um, you mentioned Field and Stream. My grandfather used to collect. He had subscriptions. That's back when you had subscriptions uh-huh. for magazines, you know, yeah. other than Dunn. Dunn Magazine's a fly fishing uh-huh. magazine that you would, and fly fishermen and stuff. But he had a, a Field and Stream magazine uh, subscription, so he had all of them. And I remember my grandmother put them in a basket, you know, out in the out in the dining room. Uh-huh. And I, I, when I started fly fishing, I would go back you know, to their house and inevitably I would look in there and I would find an article here and there of here and there yeah. field and stream that had a little little bit of information yeah, in not it. Not a but lot. Compared I, yeah. It was a, it was just a drop. I mean now I get like six in the mail right, every month. Right. You know, at least. But yeah, so you know, Kent we kinda learned and then he started getting into little at least with the casters that were showing some little potential and and, and were beyond the fundamentals, which I'd been working hard to to get beyond the fundamentals you know i was i was learning to haul and and building some distance and i would i would progress and and have a a session by myself in the yard or whatever where i thought i just got it man i was was good (laughs) yeah and then i'd go out the next afternoon and i'd be like can i why am i tying a a knot in the end every cast yeah i got four knots yeah why is that happening (laughs) you know so you know kent kind of helped me figure that out paul helped me figure it out and and then we went and did some stuff on the ponds there on the at callaway which was fun some of us caught it was it was still they still had trout so i think it was march they still had some trout in the ponds caught some big fat trout you know mm-hmm. they fed them and got yeah. them all fat and oh happy. yeah made you fat and happy too didn't yeah it? i thought yeah. i was doing something you know and then we and then we uh we did one day where we went and uh, did a day on the flint which i'd already fished the flint and floated the flint you know throwing rooster tails and little rapalas and whatnot and the I don't know if you've ever fished the Flint, but it's no, an amazing. I yet. Yeah, it's an amazing place. I mean, it's a beautiful river. It's chock full of shoal bass and now spots and other stuff. But shoal bass being the you know the the just the it's natural fish um, which are amazing. It's kind of like trout fishing, but for bass. You know, I mean, there Kent kind of showed as as we were fishing the little stretch of, of river we were showing. He kind of showed us some some neat you know tricks and whatnot to the shoal bass deal and and the river in general so like what kind of what kind of tricks do you um, show you on the show like, bass it took me a long time to get it but like the the cast other than just a basic cast like the the serpentine or the s cast or whatever um for fishing runs from above and still letting the fly drift through a through a run and the curve cast for fishing a, a pool or an eddy pool but from beside it and then you start realizing there's way more to this fly fishing thing than just putting it straight out there and letting it drift so many people um, so many people think i can cast this thing 60 feet i'm ready to conquer anything only yeah. to find out yesterday it was interesting yesterday our shots were probably for tarpon 40 feet 40 feet pretty yeah. legit shot i mean yeah, you, you, you want to try to show it to them 40 35 feet from the boat and probably. you could see them quicker than i could uh, most of them but uh-huh. we weren't casting 80 and 90 feet the wind was blowing like a banshee last yeah, night or yesterday morning anyway that, yeah. and, and so it was kind of tough to see them at one point during the day there was a few hours there where i was like all right i'm kind of getting to see <laughs> yeah. these things and i could see them almost as soon as you could but not yeah. quite but those 90 foot casts you know that we all sit They're in the backyard almost useless when they really honest. are yeah yeah a- any i mean Unless you're fishing to schools of fish, they're they're almost useless. I know there's some guys that might can th- chunk it out there 90 feet, but you you, you got to be able to see the fly. You got to be able to read the fish and know what the fly is doing in relation to the fish. And if you're 80, 90 feet away, you can't see the fly. No, I mean you, you don't know where it is in relation to the fish. Now, if there's a school of 40 fish coming up the beach, and you throw it out there in front of them, and they're 80 feet from the boat, and you throw it out there across their path and start stripping it then yeah it's gonna cross the face of a fish eventually and possibly get bit but yeah the you know you want to that 40 foot range is a give or take 10 is a good good range most you know? of them that's are. why i say if if, if anything if, if everybody that got on the boat could cast 50 feet they have adequate skills to get on the boat now that means they can cast 30 into the wind and 60 
with the wind at their back or whatever so they're kind of but if you can make a you know a, a decent 50 foot cast in you know average conditions then you're you've got enough to pretty much get it done you know so i would um, say i would add to that and say you need to be able to do that quickly and quickly urgently yes yeah because um, especially as we were downstream last night yeah. Or yesterday afternoon as we were sitting. They were moving. Oh, yeah, and they're moving with us. Yeah. They were coming at us, and the tide was coming at us. Yeah. So Uh, quickness, um, urgency, I would say, yeah, is is key. You see them, you think, oh, they're 100 feet away. They're 50 feet away in just a few seconds. It doesn't take long either. I was stunned at how quickly they were coming yesterday. And as before as I fished for tarpon, it was a little bit different because it was more of a slack tide than what we were sitting in yesterday. We and you had a little bit of time to kind of, all right, here yeah, they come. We, and everywhere we were yesterday, that water was moving, and they're riding it. It's moving, and they're going that direction. They're, they're riding it. They don't look like they're moving fast. They look effortless, and they're still carrying a pretty good pace to them. Those were. Um, those were. Not, yeah, not always the case, <laughs> Yeah, but those were. It was just um, a just that that it was just yesterday. Which, it was just that which, day. Yeah, just okay. those conditions. Yeah, yeah. Um, which requires quick, you know, on your on the angler's part to be on on his toes and ready and quick decisions, quick moves, quick hands. You know, after the flies in the water. So a, a double haul is important, not for the distance, but for the speed of the speed, delivery of the fly. Yeah. Speed. And yesterday, yeah. that's you can make was. a 30, 40, 50 foot cast without a haul. Oh, if, yeah. If you're, you know, and I did the first good. couple times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the double haul just triples your, your, your speed, your yeah. time it takes to get the fly to where it needs to be. Yeah. So Kent's teaching you all that, and he took you on the lake or in the ponds, yeah. and he took you in the river to too. the river. Yeah, to wow. the Flint, caught a few shoal bass, and we're with a group of like ten or twelve. So he's spending some time. You know, he's bouncing around, and Paul's with him, and they're kind of moving around. We're on a big, nice, wide stretch of the river that I still fish um, a lot, or when I can. Yeah, just kind of, just kind of make, and he makes it look effortless, you know, and and then you start to realize that it's not your your forearm doesn't have to burn. <laughs> you know, when you're out there casting, you know, your thumb doesn't have to cramp up. You're, you know, you, you, it, it really becomes relaxing and, you know, you can put very little effort into it as long as you're doing it right and still get the results as far as the distance and the accuracy and the timing and all that. Um, I tell you, one of the best casters I've ever seen, I'm going to call him Mr. P, just because I'm sure he wouldn't want his name spread around. Uh-huh. But he was, he's probably in his 80s, and he could, he had a Helios, which is a super nice rod. Yeah. But he would pick it up and go 40 feet with one, just pick it up and go, and it was there. Yeah. And it was right where I said, hey, put that right there. And he would put it right there. And I'd just be like, dang. I mean, and it looked like he just was in the middle of waking up from a nap. Yeah. So he wasn't in any strain or anything. He would just pick it up, load the rod, boom. Drop it where I want it, put it on the pie plate, and get a bite. Yeah, and get a bite a lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and he can mend in, in the air and do all that good uh-huh. stuff, but he never looked like he strained anything. Yeah. It was it almost made me mad. Oh, I tell people to relax a lot. Yeah. You can see them up there. They're white knuckling that. Even oh, when yeah. we're looking, you can see their, their forearms flexed, and they're, you know, they even got the rod way out to one side. I'm just like, you know, relax and, and breathe and then. But for people that are, you know, they only get to do it once or twice a year, it's, it's, they don't sleep the night before, they don't, you know, I mean, it's an intense trip, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big deal. And it, I have to step back and remind myself, I see these things a hundred days a year, you know, this is a big deal. I have to be able to relate to the fact that this is a special day, you know, for everybody that's on the boat, it's a very special day, you know, it's a big Yesterday, opportunity. that first 120 pound fish i saw uh-huh. i was like oh crap knees I, I was i was ready for it you yeah know? yeah you knew i mean i too. slept yeah i slept fine yeah the night you, before i was good you do it you fish a lot and yeah. then i saw that and i was like that's a big dang a big fish one. right there we going by some good ones yeah. yeah they're all good yeah they are I mean, that little the little guy that 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 stuck his mouth up to eat it yeah I mean, that was maybe a 50 to 60 pounder. I mean, that's an amazing oh, fish. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Amazing just, fish. Yeah. He ran out of real estate. That's all he, there was to it. Yeah. He just, he reached up there to grab it and he was sucking he was, air. Yeah. He was sucking <laughs> air. So after Kent, uh, so you're building your skill. You really, it sounds like you really built some really well, serious and, skills. And, with, with and Kent. I, you know, I own the restaurant and I work 70 hours a week, but I probably spent, I found the time to 
and I encourage everybody that wants to get good to find the time. I always I get a lot of people on the boat that uh, still have the leader on their rod that I tied on there last year when we were tarpon fishing. I'm like, oh, I can tell you hadn't been practicing much. Well, I just hadn't had time. I just hadn't had. I'm like, just 30 minutes a week, 10 minutes, three times a week. It doesn't take much. Go out there and, and go through a half dozen false cast sequences start to build some muscle memory you know so i would get out in the yard late i mean 12 o'clock at night i would go home get out of the restaurant and there was a my yard wasn't that big so when i really started casting 60 70 feet and building some distance there was a law office right across the street well you know people might discourage casting in a parking lot because it might tear up your fly line but if you want to get good and you want to know how far your cat well it had it had lines mm-hmm. so i could i knew each one was 11 feet so i knew exactly and i would make a long cast i'd lay my rod down i'd walk out there and yep. measure i'd be like oh that was 66 feet. right you right know, that's awesome i'm good right. i'll never use but, this cast but yeah it was a but, good one. <laughs> but you know you, you, yeah but you're you're working on timing and and speed and you know and all those all helps you in any distance you know then you know and and Man, I was spending so much time. I burned up some fly lines. You know, they were all stained green from yard casting, and you and know, you I can, just, I just wanted to be good. You, you know? can jack up some fly lines in the parking lot too. Oh man. yeah, this was actually a nice, <laughs> smooth asphalt, like blacktop. It yeah, was, it was pretty smooth. It wasn't real. It was like freshly painted or coated, so it didn't tear it up that bad. But it was worth it, you know, for me to, you know, and if somebody else wanted to do that, they could get a high use line just to practice with. Yeah. Have your, have your fishing line, the one you use, and then have a a old beater line that it may not be as smooth and shoot as well but it'll you're still getting the timing your rhythm your mechanics or all the things that matter you know and then you add a, a brand new line to the mix and oh, you get 10 more feet out of the deal or whatever we we interviewed jimmy harris a couple months ago of, of unicoi outfitters uh-huh. and he was talking about practicing in his truck you know yeah. practicing that movement with a pen in his hand yeah. and i was like first i thought well that's kind of crazy but then Look i thought the more i thought of it i thought that's a pretty good idea yeah. Yeah, really Look over in the it. intersection yeah. I mean, you see you see people practicing their putt or exactly like tennis you know stroke or you know and so i mean what is it to you know it's it, you're training your arm to to do what it needs to do without you having to, to think about it and that's what comes with repetitive time spent doing it and that's a lot of people when they if you don't practice enough and you get on the boat you think oh i got this you know and then the 120 pound tarpon comes swimming up and then everything falls apart immediately because your muscles are still having to rely on your brain to tell them what to do because they don't have the memory to do them without you having to communicate to yourself essentially okay drop the fly okay start you know accelerate back you know right if it's automatic then you can see the fish you're gonna get all wobbly need and everything else anyways that's part of the the thrill of it why we do it yeah but you can still manage to to get a cast you know to get the fly in the water and have your opportunity so there's nothing that can be said about practicing practicing, no no and if you've got so there's three things right there's the love of doing something and there's a desire and then there's the dedication anybody Uh can love to do something i mean i can love to eat ice cream the idea you know trust me and then I have the desire to do a lot of things, but until you actually put the dedication to it, and not just for tarpon, I mean, any trout's the yeah. same way, bluegill, uh, which are good roll cast, is critical. has to be practiced. You right. Know? I mean, it right. has to be practiced over and over and over again to be able to do it in every scenario or at least a variety of situations yeah. and scenarios. Tree here, rock there, yeah. wind blowing this way. Um, it's not There's like, always moving parts that you not, have to account for. You're not always standing in the middle of the yard with no trees around. Yeah. Sometimes you have have to you know get the tip of that rod moving uh, something besides you know, yeah. 11 and 2 or whatever it is you have to make have to believe on. you know yeah. you have to create a scenario in your head i had a big pecan tree in my front yard i worked on that curve cast around that tree until i could basically get that fly to land back over here on the total opposite side of the tree around yeah. the tree yeah. you know i wanted to be able to sit out there and do that <laughs> j cast or curve cast so many times you know I'm going to get this thing down. And now I don't use it. You know, I don't get the opportunity to use it that much. It's not really a saltwater type skill that you use, but I bet I still got it, you know, if I needed it. Yeah, might, you could pull I might, I might, you know, have to tune it up a little bit, but I probably still got it. You, you could know? probably dial it up if you had yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you've got your skills. You're starting to build your skills. What you build your skills the whole time, but yeah, you're doing day. this. Like I don't think anybody is as good as they can be. But after you start building your skills, and and just like a lot of other people, we start broadening our adventures, and and that's where I think the next influence comes in. Yeah, my buddy Chad. He was from Lagrange. Grew up with him. Actually lived with him in college for a couple of years. He was a couple of classes older than I was. After college, we kind of lost touch. Four or five years went by. I happened to be back in LaGrange at a party. Heard him talking, and he likes to talk, about fly fishing. And this was, you know, six months or so after I'd kind of been given the rod, taken the course, learned from Kent and Paul, and spent hours and hours in the yard trying to get good. I was doing a little bit of farm pond fishing. I was fishing some of the small creeks around Auburn. I'd gone a couple of times to like the Coosa and the Tallapoosa and some stuff over there and the Flint some more and heard Chad talking about fly fishing. So, you know, we were still good buddies, but we just were doing different things in, in two different places and started talking to him about it. He was like, oh yeah, you know, and he was explaining to me, you know, he'd kind of just gotten into it I think he had one rod too at the same time that i had one rod so we started planning trips and i had the cabin at, you know at my disposal in the mountains and uh so we would same thing we'd get up at five in the morning four in the morning drive to north georgia fish the day on the tacoa which is about 45 minutes kind of west of the cabin then drive to the cabin spend the night and then either go to the chatuga or fish some of the smaller creeks and then drive back you know, because I had to be back in Auburn. I might only have a day off from work or whatever, being in the restaurant business. But we would get up there at least a couple of times a month. He also had a, a, a nice farm pond out of his, his parents had a dairy farm that had some really nice bass and bluegill in it that, you know, neither of us had skiffs at this point in time. So we were doing everything we could do minus, you know, boats to do it in. Um, a lot of bank fishing. A lot of bank lot fishing. Of bank um, the nice thing about their dairy farm farm ponds is there was only trees on the dam. Everything else was open field. Mm. So you could cast all, you know, you could start getting a good distance out into the pond. Caught, caught a eight, just under eight pounds, seven pound, nine ounce bass on on a pop rather which still to this day is my biggest bass on a fly um i'd love to break the 10 pound mark at some point but who knows if that'll ever happen that's, that's pretty all. big achievement so chad and i you know then then we were able to we're developing at the same time we're kind of wanting to be better than each other as far as distance and who catches what and, and there's always so it, that i want to catch it, a bigger fish than my well, buddy it pushes you yeah you know which is a good thing yeah you know and then we start buying you know eight weights chad had a condo down down in panama city i bought a skiff shortly within a, about a year of that time and then we started being able to come down stay at the condo fish west bay east bay north bay um, which is kind of why I mentioned that that's kind of my, you know, one of my favorite. If not, if I had to choose one one area, at least that I know I can fish regularly, that would, you know, probably be it. And then we started going to Louisiana in like '06, right after Katrina. And then some trips to Flamingo, you know, and, and Louisiana was what really got us. We would do crazy five day stints. I would start working like I had two other had another managing partner at the restaurant and another manager assistant manager i'd start working like three doubles in a row <laughs> which meant like three 16 hour days in a row and then let them kind of figure out how we wanted to split up the other four days between them and so that i could go to louisiana for four days so you really got it bad yeah at that point yeah. we had it bad and then then we were getting into into tarp and <laughs> you know not too long after that i'd say uh 2008 my granddad um, lived over in Panacea um, on Lock Lockney Bay over there and he had a tarpon over his mantle when he bought the house he retired and, and lived down there in his retirement I don't know 80 pound tarpon or something and, and the first time I went in the house I looked up at the mantle and saw it and I was like what is that we're, we're Georgia boys we only vacationed in North Florida we didn't think tarpon were we didn't know tarpon were here you know there's Guys people that, out there right now still, that don't know tarpon I get here. them all the time yeah. locals that yeah. don't they don't know they're here he's like that's a tarpon I said where did they catch that he said, right out here in the bay. That's what the guy that bought the house from said. I said, ah, oh, come on. Those things only live down in the Keys or whatever, you know. He's like, oh, that's what they said. Well, we, we had hooked a couple of tarpon off the dock after that. <laughs> and uh, on, like, little light tackle stuff, we were just hoping to catch reds or whatever. We, or we were floating. We were actually trying to catch gar, alligator gar. We'd be floating pinfish <laughs> under a hook out off the dock, and you'd hook a tarpon. And it would, of course, immediately blow out and pop and 
done and wreck um, your stuff and yeah it would never even get to that point <laughs> you know we, so then he's like oh yeah they live all around here well that was earlier on that was pre-fly fishing so then it kind of dawned on us that 10 years later or whatever that wait a minute there's tarp in there you know so then we started buying 12 weights and and then we started doing really crazy stuff like he'd be down here i would leave i would work my doubles leave and drive to lanark and he'd be sitting at the boat ramp i'd get right on the boat we'd fish we'd stay at the uh moorings hotel over there in carabel and hit it again then i would drive back the next afternoon and be back at work the next morning we did that like every at least three weekends a month during june and july and we had to have them i mean that was and and you know there was there was some skiffs around i'm not saying we were we didn't pioneer anything by any means but you might only see four or five skiff trailers in the parking lot you know in in 07 08 09 now you see 35 yeah And, and it was old timers jack west guys like that who were over there sitting on their spots you know I mean, it was just there and, and they'd let you kind of buddy up behind them off to one side they teach you etiquette we did some dumb things we got cussed at and fussed at and yelled at but we at the same time even then you really didn't have ease of information that you have now you know i mean that's 12 years ago 14 years ago whatever and so you had to learn by getting fussed at by live fire yeah yeah and and <laughs> You know, but, and that was a good way to learn because we got to sit back behind and beside some legends of the land art fishery over there, you know. And that, and then that was, that was kind of, you know, when I knew that when I was done with that restaurant, that I was, that was what I was, that I was going to do. That's and a really to, neat area over there that you're talking about. Is, we went over there and fished yeah. a couple of years ago for tarpon and. It's a great area. Um, it's definitely got a lot, gotten a, a lot of pressure it has, in the last, yeah. you know, six, eight years. Yeah. Um, with the popularity of saltwater fly fishing and, and the exposure and the social media and whatnot, it is definitely, and I used to, we used to fish over there pretty much pre-guiding for tarpon all the time. I mean, that was our deal. I just didn't want to live over there. You know, I right. wanted to, I wanted, I, I, I loved the Mexico Beach, St. Joe area, and uh, which is, is good. It's great tarpon fishing, yeah. You know, but you're near thing, you know. Over there, you're. It's a long way yeah, away from Tallahassee's everything. up the road a bit, but other than that, you're in you're you're out there. I'd love to live over there a couple months a year, but I I wanted to live somewhere and be able to fish. I, I got four boat ramps within seven miles of my house that all put me into different scenarios. No, you they know? do, don't they? Yeah. You got East Bay on Over Street. You got Crooked Island. You got Mexico Beach. You got St. Joe. And a little bit further, you got Indian Pass, you know. So I can go three different directions and be at a boat ramp within 10 minutes. Yeah. And I'll be in fairly different little water, you know, especially the East Bay backside stuff and then the beach on the, you know, and then St. Joe Bay are all very different. I would say Fisheries. yesterday we left from Port St. Joe and we were we saw our first tarpon within thirty minutes. Would you say something like that? Probably Not counting yeah. the stop that yeah. we stopped in the middle out there and watched yeah, the birds. Yeah, yeah, just to see what was happening. Yeah, pretty, pretty yeah. quick. Yeah, it was I mean we're we're starting to uh, you know this time of year you're you're starting to have some some decent days. You're, yeah, you're, you could. You could have a day where, you know, it looked like today where it's beautiful and you might not see 10 fish, Yeah, you know, might not get a legitimate shot. And then you turn around the next day and get 20 shots and see 80 fish or whatever it is, you know, and, it, and then it builds from here, you know, and then by late May and you get into June and July and then you start really getting the big migratory groups coming through and, and, uh. It's still a little early, probably. It's, it's, but it's, it's I'd say, yeah, I, I, I typically start booking tarpon trips confidently 15th of May. Yeah. Um, before that, it's kind of like, here's the deal. Yeah. You know, we're going to go if you, if you, and, and, and give you the option. There's other things we could do. We very well might get plenty of shots at tarpon, but we may not. And then after like the 15th of May or, or so, I don't question it in my head or, or even try to convince them that it might not be the best idea. It's game on from from there. Um, yeah, you were telling me, giving me that spill of, well, it's early, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And I was like, hey, I don't care. I'm coming. Yeah, you were here, and yeah. you wanted to do it, and you need your tarpon. And, yeah. And, uh, and they were around, and I'd been seeing them for a, for a few days, and uh, I was confident we would – you know, we had decent conditions. We had good sun, and wind was blowing a little harder than the weatherman predicted, which it normally <laughs> is. But yeah, it was it was a good it was a good day for that time for this time of year for sure. So you you start out fishing uh, in the Grange with gear, and then you move into trout with your grandmother. You get get your fly rod from your 
employee who yeah. guides in Alaska. And uh-huh. Then you hook up with Kent at Callaway. Uh, me. And then you and Chad start your fishing adventure. The next thing you know, we're sitting here at uh, whatever yeah. the name of this place is. I can't remember the name of this yeah. house that we're in. St. George. Yeah, Affinity. That's the Affinity. name of this house. Yeah. Uh, right on the beach at St. George, and we're sitting out looking at the at the water right now, which it looks fantastic, actually. Yeah, it does. I'm, I'm surprised if we looked long enough, we wouldn't see some tarpon sliding by. I'll yeah. Know. I know they're there. They're just not showing. Well, Cleve, I really appreciate you coming by. Yes, I know sir. that's quite a bit of quite a bit of haul over here about an hour a little bit of not bad. about an hour i haven't been over here in a little while I like to see see what it looks like every now and then well you can find cleave at www.forgottencoastonthefly.com uh for tarpon redfish around the forgotten coast area in the summer uh, i fish with louisiana you fish there in the fall and early winter if you get a really good day over there you can, he'll take you out to chandelier islands but it mm-hmm. just almost has to be the perfect situation yeah. but Trust me, it's worth it to be two miles from the boat ramp or, as we were talking about, about an hour from the yeah. boat ramp uh, in an 18-foot skiff, and he's just a guy to, to take you to do that, and I can say that from experience. Uh, but I appreciate you coming out Sorry. here with the mobile studio, and uh, for the listener out there, you've been listening to Southeastern Fly, the angler's influence. You can find us at www.southeasternfly.com. Appreciate you listening. Thanks, Cleve. Thank you.